All right. Hello. I'm uh, Wout. I'm, uh, we're here today all together to uh, talk about DVM and the subject for the, from zero day to zero threat, why threat and vulnerability management is an essential part of that journey. Um, I'm joined today by Das Lecomte and, and uh, Michael van Hodenbeek. Uh, they both have a lot of acronyms. Uh, Michael is an MVP in, in MCSM. Uh, also the CEO of the collective. Uh, they're both focused on, on the security uh, stack of Microsoft and TAS is a Microsoft MVP, um, Modern Workplace Consultants. And both of them are also authors of the Microsoft 365 security book that we'll be giving away at the end of this session as well. And uh, I'm out, I'm co-founder at Scatman and I'll be giving you a very brief demo of what we can do uh, with Scatman to help some of the challenges that TVM are gonna uh, make clear for you. Um, for the raffle at the end, we're giving away a ticket to go to uh, MMS. MMS is an event in the US, in, in Minnesota. Um, so if you retweet this tweet, I'm sure that someone will be putting a link to the tweet in the chat, uh, then, then you can participate. And at the end of the webinar, we'll give away that ticket. And now I'll give the floor to Taz and Michael. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today uh, on the session where we're going to talk about threat and vulnerability management and why this is so super important. Uh, before we do, though, um, a couple of things right, about the current state of cybersecurity and the challenges that we have today. Um, not a single day goes by without the news about one or the other hack or attack or breach or uh, data loss or you know, data being leaked anywhere on the internet. And when you take a look at any cybersecurity website, um, you know, there is just a plethora of, 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 of examples, right? Um, what you see here on screen is just a couple of snippets from uh, a couple of popular uh, cybersecurity websites, like ThreatPost, for instance, where um, you can see what we're dealing with, right? Whether it is ransomware or zero date or a vulnerability, uh, an old school vulnerability being, um, being exploited. They all lead to a massive amount of impact for organizations, small and large. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, we have everything that's going on uh, in the world. The reality is that um, current events like what's happening in Ukraine or you know, previously Corona are uh, a massive uh, you know, opportunity for cyber criminals to start exploiting these events and use the, the natural human behavior of being interested in what's happening around them to deceive and, and uh, uh, to deceive people and have them do things in order to gain access to the environment. Now, to just take a look at some of the examples on the screen, right? Like last year, we had the EMS exchange under attack, right? The half million attacks were by vulnerability, a zero-day vulnerability. The exchange was exploited um, and therefore led to a massive amount of servers worldwide being being attacked. Uh, even up until today, there are organizations which still have vulnerable uh, exchange servers. Um, one of the things that uh, is not here on the screen, but definitely was something that that, that hurt us, was Log4j at the end of last year, whereby, uh, again, countless organizations worldwide were vulnerable to a fairly simple to execute attack, which gave uh, attackers access to the uh, to the environment where these vulnerable systems were running into. Um, but all of that just, you know, kind of uh, amounts up to the, the fact that uh, we have multiple challenges in the uh, cybersecurity world that we have to deal with. Um, so, uh, Tess, if you could go to the next slide, please. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, when we take at the current landscape, right, um, the current threat landscape, and in addition to all the examples that you saw before, uh, there are a, a number of elements that we can uh, kind of can identify. Um, one of the elements that we can identify is the increasing number of zero day attacks. Now, it doesn't mean that you know zero day attacks is all that you have to worry about. The number of zero days being exploited and leading to a breach of the environment are not the highest amount of, of, of attacks or breaches happen. These are the most visible ones because typically I'm going to refer back to Log4j or I'm going to refer back to Exchange Hafnium are the ones whereby you know critical infrastructures or organizations are being hacked because they don't have the time to respond or they didn't respond in a timely manner. 
Um, at the end of the day, regardless, regardless of what you do or how you deal with it, even if you have the best patch management strategy whereby you roll out patches within a day, there's nothing you can do about a zero day, right? All you have to do is be aware of the fact that it exists and respond to that in, 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 a, uh, in a good manner. Um, let, let's just take the example of Exchange Patent. Right? Let's say the news broke on you know, a Tuesday where Microsoft had on Patch Tuesday. You know, here's what happens. Um, here's a zero-day vulnerability, and here's the patch. Then it still takes a couple of days, a couple of hours, you know, at the minimum, for you to deploy that across your estate. Now, a good threat uh, threat management program that you may have in your organization will uh, challenge two things. Well, A, how long does it take for you to deploy that patch within the environment? And B, if it takes too long, what are you going to do in the meantime? A good response would have been to take these servers offline, quote unquote, not take the servers offline, but make sure that they're not externally um, exposed anymore while you're patching that. Um, yes, it means that functionality that was available to your users will temporarily be unavailable, but the alternative is, you know, having the chance or, or having the, the odd chance of being attacked or being breached. Again, these are very uh, exceptional circumstances, but these are the things that are part of um, a, a, a good uh, threat and the threat and vulnerability management program. And this is also the reason why we're having this talk today of how you can overcome some of these challenges around that. But it's not just the fact that there is uh, you know, an increasing number of zero days, because as I said, there's very little that you can do other than have a, pr a process in place on how to respond to them. But it's also what leads to uh, or what the consequences are of a vulnerability or a threat materializing within the environment. Um, what we see today is that the number of attacks is not only increasing, but the complexity thereof is also increasing, uh, creating other challenges. Um, for instance, whereby previously you had one type of system that you had to take into consideration, or be better said, let's let's take a step back and, and go back 12, 15 years in time. Um, 12, 15 years ago, all, if not, everything you had was on premises at the best in, in the best case you had a service provider that had you know a, a data center that they hosted for you which was your private cloud i would say whereby some of your applications and server were hosted um but basically you get the on-prem ad you may have had a dmz with a very you know uh, uh heterogeneous environment where you knew you had what you had running but then, you know, with the rise of the cloud, um, more and more organizations are starting different platforms, different applications, and they're hosted everywhere. And um, to make things worse, these platforms and systems are, uh, you know, not are not, are not uniform anymore. Um, you may be using Azure, you may be using the Google Cloud Platform, and you may be using AWS, each of which have their own types of config configuring stuff of maintaining security which means that you now also have to have the expertise on how to deal with these platforms to keep the systems running within these platforms secure. Um, add into that Office 365, Azure AD, or Okta, you know, uh, all uh, other types of uh, identity providers as well. And you now have a, a, a much broader attack surface, making it much, much harder for you to keep control. Um, Include into that, right? Not just the, the the fact that things are becoming more complex, but that we're battling a shortage in skills. And uh, I'm sure that every one of you um, understands what I'm talking about. But there's two things happening with regards to the shortage of skills today. First of all, it's just there's not enough people in cybersecurity, uh, but in IT in general, to deal with the workload. Um, all too often, IT admins need to, you know, uh, put out fires, right? They need to keep the lights on, keep everything up and running, but at the same time, they're expected to be experts in making everything secure. Now, go back to what I said earlier, right? Where you have cloud platforms here, you've got systems there, you've got a plethora of things that you have to to master. It is impossible to keep track of everything and to be the, the you know, the jack of all trades and the master of all of everything, right? Um, so there's no wonder that the the saying goes a little bit different. So in addition to the fact that there is much more complexity and the complexity coming from the variety and the integrations that exist between all the applications and platforms that you're using, there's also the, the, the fact that uh, we're now dealing with these, what I call digital natives. Uh, and again, I don't mean that in a bad way, but um, consider the fact that um, the, 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 the people now, you know, um, coming right off of school and going into the workforce market, um, they have lots of experience or well, they have some experience in the cloud, but they have very little experience with what we call legacy these days, but that legacy is still 
very much there. We're still dealing with Active Directory and we're going to deal with Active Directory for the next 10, 15 years uh, at least. But people coming into the job market now do not have the same set of skills as people that came into the job market 10, 15 years ago. So what we're seeing now is that there are organizations that have IT admins and security people that do not fully understand the scope of the applications that they have to deal with. So in addition to the fact that there's not enough people, not always do these people have the same, the, the right set of skills. So how, how can you deal with that on, on an organizational level and, and you know, um, how, how to deal with that on an organizational level is better said, and how to make sure that you have the expertise and you have the time to deal with everything is obviously by, um, by offloading some of the work um, that is related to keeping the lights on, on making sure that things are secure, that things are running the way they should so that you don't have to take care of that. But offloading things doesn't, <clears throat> apologize, doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to follow up what's happening, right? Uh, let's take a look at the breach that happened at Octum, right? They had a service provider that was breached and that gave access to the environment. Well, I mean, they offloaded some of the work to someone else, but at the end of the day, they still need to monitor what these people are doing or what these service providers are doing for you. Now, um, when we kind of tie all of that together and look at the impact and look at what it means, then um, <clears throat> consider this, right? Um, we spoke about the challenges in terms of how people get access to the environment. And typically, you know, it is either phishing, number one, like way up there. Um, I think almost every attack I know starts with, with some sort of phishing attempt, whether it's email or Teams messages or a text message, whatever it is. And then um, after that, something needs to be exploited. And in most of the cases, unless it's a misconfiguration, um, in about 60%, a little bit less, uh, a data breach or the start of a breach starts with a vulnerability. Now, again, that vulnerability doesn't mean it has to be a zero day. Most of the time, um, hacks happen because of vulnerability that has existed for years. And um, when we take a look at that, um, about 57% happens because something was exploited that you could have could have prevented and something that you could have prevented by patching in time. Now, let that sink in for a minute, right? Um, wh why is this happening? Well, it's because we, we don't have control anymore or not sufficient control anymore about uh, over our application landscape. Um, one of the challenges that we deal with as consultants with organizations that we consult with is the fact that um, you know they have a, a management infrastructure, they have thousands of devices or even hundreds of devices, but they don't have full control over what's happening, what their users are doing, and that you know sometimes because of shadow IT, because of the lack of expertise, because of the lack of understanding of everything, leads to a vulnerable place, leads to a vulnerable situation, and that is something that you absolutely have to you know get back to right and get control over, so that at the very least, right, the things that you can easily manage are managed properly, so that you know whenever there's a new application out there. It is being patched automatically. You'd expect that in 2022, you know, a lot of these automatic patching uh, mechanisms are already top notch, and they would be doing that. But the fact is that most application vendors, like most of them, they do, you know, I was only going to almost going to say a really bad word, but they do a fairly bad job at keeping their own software up to date. And they rely way too much on end users or applications doing something, which means that it now becomes the responsibility of IT to actually. You know, deploy patches, do it on a regular basis, follow up on everything that's happening. Now, consider the fact that you have hundreds of applications and versions running into your environment. You know, how do, a how do you know what you've got running? B how do you know which versions you you've got running? And C how do you know if there is a vulnerability or a potential for exploitation in one of these applications? These are three really really big challenges that contribute to the increase of your attack surface. Therefore lead to an increased chance of potentially being breached or uh, data loss or whatsoever and so forth and so on. So with that, um, let's talk about threat and vulnerability management um, and what Microsoft TVM can do. Now, TVM itself right, is not a new concept. Threat and vulnerability management has been around for a long time. For people that have been in IT as long as I do, we, you, know, you probably know the first iteration of Qualys Guard where you know, there was an appliance in the data center you know, scanning all the websites for vulnerabilities that it knew of. Um, and that same principle kind of trickled into the endpoint world whereby uh, Tenable, for instance, has a solution or has had a solution for many, many years, you know, scanning endpoints for uh, known and you know, potentially new vulnerabilities. 
well, at some point, Microsoft was bound to to jump on that same um, that same bandwagon and uh, uh, speak or look into the, the vulnerabilities. And obviously, who more or, who, or whom better than Microsoft has visibility into what's happening in Windows? Obviously, TVM doesn't stop just by Windows. It also looks at Mac OS and Linux and so forth and so on. But at, at, at that point in time, <clears throat> um, when they introduced TVM, it was a logical evolution because um, for better and worse, TVM will not keep you safe, right? It brings visibility. Um, I usually refer to um, to the approach in cybersecurity. I, I kind of you know uh, link it to the NIST cybersecurity framework because I think it's a very simple framework, but it clearly outlines five different activities an organization should do to keep themselves safe in the current uh, the current cybersecurity landscape. Right? You have to identify the threats that you're dealing with, right? Which is applicable to your environment. Once you have identified what's happening, then you have to protect, detect, and respond. So you know, make sure that you protect your assets where you can, detect if they are breached, and respond adequately if they are. And then ultimately, if all the previous phases have failed to produce anything useful and you are breached, then you should be able to recover uh, from a breach, from a ransomware, from data loss, from whatever it is, right? So you have to do activities in all of these different phases, if you will, to have an adequate protection of your environment. Now. You know, TVM itself is more in the in the first phase, right, where you are identifying what's happening. Know before you go. In Dutch, we have a saying that says that meten is weten. It basically means, you know, as soon as you start looking into things, you know what you're dealing with. You can more adequately plan and react and do things. Now, TVM is exactly that, right? Um, in addition to all the other capabilities that live within the Defender platform that play in the protection, the detection, and the response phases, uh, it can bring um, uh, bring to life what's happening within your environment. It will show you um, it will show you that um, you have specific applications running or specific software running. It will show you if there are vulnerabilities, whether or not, whether or not for these vulnerabilities there are known public exploits, and that information is then distilled at the very, you know, I'm speaking very fast because there's so much to talk about, but that will be put in a list of recommendations that tell you, okay, so these are your top threats. You know, tag these first, right? Handle these first in order to increase your score, reduce your attack surface, and become safer on the internet, right? Become safer in the cybersecurity landscape. Now, you know, with this introdu uh, introduction, you kind of understand why TVM is a really, really, really important part, right? Because it's the preparation of everything else that follows. Um, I'll gladly pass it on to Tess, who will now talk a little bit more about the details of TVM, and if time allows, maybe show a couple of things as well. So Tess, please, you take it off. Thanks a lot, Michael. So Michael already touched upon on the support of devices and what TVM sees. Um, and to be honest, I think this is an an underestimated feature from Microsoft is that it's not only talking about Windows clients, but it's also not just talking about clients, about end-user devices. It's so much more. To be honest, this feature might be hidden away, but they do provide you the opportunity to have a clear overview of your entire environment, not just focusing on those endpoints. So if we dive deeper into what is supported, what are the platforms we support, what is Microsoft Defender seeing and which data is being put into TVM. So first of all, of course, it's the clients. So this means Windows, both Windows clients and Windows servers. Um, this is, of course, the main part of an organization, probably. And then also we have Mac OS and Linux. Mac OS have, has full support for the last few iterations of Mac OS, while Linux is, um, there's no full support yet, not every this, Distro is supported from Linux, but there is a wide range um, of support for the different Linux distros. But that's just clients. As you can see, there's lots of place here. It doesn't end there. What do we also have? Well, we have mobile devices. Um, I think it's almost two years ago now that Defender for Endpoints became available on your mobile devices, so Android and iOS. And it will actually also scan these devices to check if there are vulnerabilities in place on those devices, which can be extremely powerful because Michael also talked about the challenge. And of course, one of the challenges is everybody is working from everywhere. Um, and we kind of went from a company owned device, you do all the work there, to a bring your own device. And while this is great, I'm seeing a lot of organizations coming back from this approach. Because opening your entire environments to the entire internet can be pretty dangerous. If 
you are logged in on your personal device, you have a login token, a PRT token on that device. If there's malware on that personal device, they can steal the token and log into your Office 365 accounts, which can have a big impact. So having visibility, not only on company devices, but also on those Android and iOS devices is extremely important. These are two capabilities that I think maybe most of you know. What is also in here? Well, we have networking devices as well. Um, so it was last year, I think, a new feature was introduced to scan networking devices. This is currently focused on um, access bounds, routers and firewalls, which means it will scan it in the network and it will add those devices to your list of devices as well. If there is, for example, a Cisco switch with an out of date um, operating system, it will notify you which vulnerabilities are applicable to that operating system of your switches or your firewalls which makes DVM a great product to not only focus on Windows devices, but also focus on other devices with other operating systems. And then besides that, we also have IoT devices. Um, this was pretty new, I think, last year, at the end of the year, this was, this was introduced. So this is essentially everything which is not a client or a network device. So for example, it was just last week, I got a vulnerability information about a Apple TV. So when Apple TV was on the network of a customer, have no idea why, but it was on there. And we could see that there was a vulnerability on that Apple TV just because it has an out of date operating system. And by having that visibility, not only focusing on Windows clients or Mac OS or Linux, but looking into the entire scope. Because of course, an attacker will look into the weak points of an, of an environment, and it will not only focus on a Windows device or a firewall. If there's any other device out there, they will try to breach this and then do lateral movement to other parts of the environment. So having a full scope of your environment and knowing what you have is so extremely important. But of course, you need to know what you have. And that's where another feature comes from Defender and TVM. It's the device discovery. Because by default, within your inventory, you will only see devices which are onboarded. So they are onboarded into Microsoft Defender for Endpoints, the EDR, and you will see recommendations for those devices. What do we have? Well, we have this device discovery. This means in the default configuration from Defender for Endpoints, each onboard Windows client will actively probe the network to check if there are devices which are one, not onboarded, or if they're not onboarded, also give recommendation for those not onboarded devices. So this means if they're using an out of date protocol, for example, you will see that in the recommendation. So it might be that you have some devices on the network which are not onboarded and you cannot onboard, say for example, devices without a direct internet connection, or we cannot onboard them, that's not supported, but you might want to have visibility on that. So that's why Microsoft introduced the device discovery, which means Windows devices will probe the network to check are there any devices which are not onboarded, alert on that, but also if they're not onboarded, what vulnerabilities lie. And if we look into the portal as well, we can see that an authenticated scan will be coming in the future. So I would assume this means that right now, uh, recommendations for not onboarded devices is pretty limited, that it would expand to show you logging into the device and um, scraping all of the applications installed on an onboarded device to get those recommendations as well. So device discovery is both used for um, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and IoT devices. For network devices, we have to have um, something else in place. So network devices are not scanned by default and we need to have SNMP scanning enabled. This means configuring all your network devices with an SNMP username and password and putting it up into the Defender portal. After that, you download the scanner on a onboarded client or server, and you have that uh, scanner scanning the network, certain IP ranges throughout the network. And this will allow you to do an inventory of every network device in your environment, but also look into, okay, um, what are the vulnerabilities for those network devices? 
So the Viasat company lets you have an overview of not only devices which are onboarded into Microsoft Defend for Endpoints, but also having a broader scope to see of the not onboarded devices, what recommendations do we have here? And this ties into, okay, if we have visibility through TVM, if we have device which is onboarded, or we have a not onboarded device being scanned, what will we see? Well, in my opinion, there are three main categories for this, and the recommendations you will see this in the portal to show you those categories as well. So first of all, we have configuration changes, which means more on the OS level. So if you have um, an example that everybody will know, attack service reduction groups, TVM will check is, um, is ASR enabled on that device, yes or no? And if it's fine, the configuration which needs to be changed, it will put ASR recommending to put it into a block map. Now, of course, it's Microsoft. They will recommend Microsoft specific solutions to the antivirus of Microsoft or, or other Edge, for example. Um, but it goes farther than that. If you scroll down and look into the details, you will also find um, configuration changes for Chrome, for example, or um, really useful things like disabling autoplay on Windows, which is so underestimated, but this provides you an opportunity to look into what settings do I have on my devices which are insecure by default? And maybe I should implement some kind of security baseline to push that. Of course, this is configuration changes. What else do we have? We have, um, of course, updates. So both operating updates and application updates. So if Linux is out of date or Windows is out of date, you will see your recommendation. And of course, for applications as well. Um, which applications do we see? Well, in the inventory, we will see every application which is installed. It doesn't matter if it's a self-developed one or not, you will see it all. Um, but the scanning of CVE, so the scanning of vulnerabilities, is done through the CPE code. So only if a device, uh, if an application has registered a CPE code, will you see the vulnerabilities. That's just an important thing to take with you. If you look into TVM and you mitigate all of the vulnerabilities, it doesn't mean that there are no vulnerabilities left. It just means the vulnerabilities are not publicly available, which is just an important note to take into account. So all of these recommendations will be combined into the exposure score. So the exposure score is in the TVM portal where you will see a score from one to, to from uh, zero to 100. So zero is the lowest. You don't have any exposure. You don't have any recommendations. You are safe until 100. Your environment is littered with, um, with vulnerabilities. And this is just a, a nice score to report to management, for example, before we started doing application updates or before we started implementing security baseline, it was at 70, but then it switched to 37 because of the implementations we did. Of course, bringing this down to zero is impossible. I haven't seen any organization doing this just because there's always new vulnerabilities and you will always have devices which are not reporting, not online, showing all data. So going through zero is not possible. Um, but having a score between zero and 30 should be the goal. And if you put some work into it, it's very achievable. So we went through lots of slides now. Let's look into the portal just to show you a, a quick demo. So the TVM portal is in the security center from Microsoft. So security.microsoft.com is the portal from Microsoft which contains all of the security related configuration. TVM is located in endpoints. We have the device inventory, which shows us, okay, which devices do we have? And this is more particular to both Defender for Endpoint, the EDR solution, but it also takes into account TVM and the backend. So we can see which computers and mobile devices do we have and are they onboarded or not? Having a device onboarded will provide much more recommendations compared to a device which is not onboarded. And then we have networking devices, which is done through the scanner, which you can enable through SNMP scanning. And IoT devices are discovered by other onboarded devices. This is a test environment, so of course I don't have much in there, 
but it just goes to show you what the different types are. And on going into vulnerability management, if you go into the dashboard, we will be greeted with the exposure score, which is what I talked about, so we can see what is happening. And we have different graphs showing you what is going on. Um, these graphs might not be that applicable to you, but I want to provide a tip um, is that you should be using device groups. So you can group device into a particular group. It's a group specific to the vendor. But for example, we do this and we divide most of the times organization different business units. So we have, um, for example, the US office, the European office, the Asian office, and we can compare the scores from these offices between each other. And this is really useful as well if you have um, organizations with different sub companies, operating companies, and there's a new acquisition, you can immediately see, okay, the security of that acquired company is this, and we can see the recommendations specific to that company. And of course, we can see the recommendations. So this is the entire list of recommendations that are applicable to your environment. What have they seen? Um, and of course, you will see first um, the most important ones. So this is filtered on the impact, which is based on two things. It's based on how many devices are impacted by this and what is the threat level. So the threat level is also um, depicted by those two icons. So having this little insect means that, okay, there is a exploit for, for this vulnerability publicly available. You could go into the dark web on GitHub, whatever, download the um, exploit and use it. This little dark icon, if I can say, means that is there an incident currently in the environment thrown by Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, which uses this exploit, which uses this vulnerability? If you ever see this icon lit up, you should be taking immediate action because it means you're being pwned by something that you should or could be avoiding. So just a quick overview of the recommendations. Of course, it's Microsoft. So for example, they will show ASR um, at first and the top, but there's lots of useful recommendations up here from configuration changes to updates, which is something I do recommend you check out. So coming back to the slides, and um, almost finishing up on the TVM side, TVM will show you lots of data. It will show you all of the applications which need updating. In a regular environment, you will be surprised on how many different applications you see. Even if users don't have local admin, they can always install applications in their local profile. And you will see so many different applications. You will see Chrome while it's not allowed. You will see Zoom while they use Teams. You will see LibreOffice because they don't want to buy a license for Office 365. So much is out there. Um, so it means that pushing those updates is a continuous process. So of course, how would you do that um, with Entune, with Microsoft Endpoint Manager? There are a few different steps, and each of these steps take a while, of course. So first step is looking for updates, of course. Going through TVM, is there an update available for Chrome? Of course, it was the exploit last week. I hope you all have um, Chrome patched um, right now. If you don't, you should, because there is an, exploit, an, an active exploit. Um, but so first, knowing what update should I push? Of course, then what happens is you need to download the MSI. So you need to go out to the Google, um, the Google site and download the MSI for the Google Enterprise um, browser. Then you need to check, okay, which silent install commands do I need to give? Because each um, application will have a different parameter. If you have all that, you need to wrap it into an Intune WIM file, which means, okay, we can package it ready for Intune use and we can upload it. After it's packaged, you need to check, okay, if the application is installed, how can we verify that? Because after Intune installs an application, it will try to detect the installation of this application. That could, that could be by um, detecting the executable specific registry key, but looking for something on the device specifically to verify is this installation succeeded or not. Then the step next is, of course, taking the Intune WIM file, uploading that into the Intune portal, and configuring it and deploying it. Well, it doesn't end there. 
And that's a common mistake I see. Um, great, we have a new Chrome update. Let's push it through every device. Well, it can be pretty dangerous. One of them, you could be impacting the business because most, lots of business applications will depend on, for example, Chrome um, as an ERP system. And if something breaks in the 20 year old ERP system, you might have a problem. But also, how will this interact with, for example, your current um, deployment procedure? If you're using autopilot, autopilot is finicky sometimes, doesn't work all the great, unfortunately, but you should be able to um, test the deployments of the application to get with autopilot to make sure you don't have any issues. After that, the final step, when you tested it, when you package it all, you can release it. But of course, having all these steps for each application, and there is an update every day almost, multiple updates every day, that will take um, quite a long time. So I will gladly hand it over now to Wout, who will discuss what Scapman can do for you to try to ease this burden. Thanks, Des. Really interesting, guys. Um, and yeah, very nice for me to plug into um, because the slide you've just shown, that's exactly what we can automate for our customers. So the one sentence of what we do, what describes what we do with Scatman is we automate your application installs and updates using Microsoft Endpoint Manager. But we also try to solve some of uh, MIM's limitations. I'm going to try to call it MIM. I'm getting old, so I might, may switch to Intune as well. Uh, and one of the things that we do that you already touched on is uh, update rings. So like you said, you don't just want to update all of your applications at the same time. Uh, you want to do it staggered, just like we do with Windows updates. You don't just want to roll it out to, to all of your users at the same time, especially if it's a critical application. There's also a very cool feature in Intune that I'm a very big fan of, and it's available on applications. You're uh, giving applications to a user that they can choose via the company portal if they want to install them or not. I'm, I'm a big fan of the feature because you give freedom to your users. But the issue is that you can't actually use it right now uh, from an IT admin perspective because you lose control over that application. So say today uh, we're making version 1.0 available and tomorrow we update that to 1.1. Uh, the user is supposed to go back to the company portal to actually update to, to 1.1. But I think we can all agree that that's never actually going to happen and you'll probably be stuck with that version 1.0 until the end of times. And then Intune will also very nicely tell you when something goes wrong with an install. That's great. It gives you uh, some error code and exit code. That's nice. But why exactly it went wrong is always cumbersome to troubleshoot. Uh, there is a, a feature in Intune that allows you to automatically collect logs from those devices, but you have to tell it exactly which log file you're looking for. Obviously, I, I don't know anyone that always knows all of the log files by heart. So that's also something that we help you with. We automate all of the all of those log file collections for you. And last but not least, uh, we also thought a bit about the, the users. Um, so by default, Intune, when it's going to update an application, it'll just shut it down, which is obviously not great if your user just happens to be watching uh, a YouTube movie or something. He's not going to like that or she's not going to like that. Um, so what we do is we do user interaction when we have to uh, so that the user can choose whether to install the app straight away or to postpone it, etc., etc. But obviously, the biggest challenge with managing all of those applications is, is just the sheer amount of time it takes to uh, to keep them up to date. Um, for example, we're going back to Google Chrome. There is 1.2 updates of Google Chrome a week. Um, it takes you between three to eight hours to package. And actually, the testing bit is what takes up most time, uh, especially if, if you're uh, not used to it, then it really becomes a lot of time that you spend on managing uh, those, those updates. So that's for a single application that you're already spending a lot of time. Uh, but then if you look at the number of applications that you have in your environment, then you really end up with a lot of time that you should spend on, on managing and updating those apps, which is, of course, a challenge. And it actually gets worse if you're a managed service provider, because then you also have to do that for every single customer. So you're really in a pickle because you're you're going to be spending a lot of time on managing all of those uh, applications. So what we have as a solution is really a, a SaaS. So we really want we're really 100% cloud. We're integrating with your uh, Microsoft 365 subscription. And we make it very easy and automated to uh, deploy those applications and their updates 
uh, it's really a set and forget solution where you can configure it once and then we'll take care of it for you and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Just to give you an idea about where we plug in, these are the standard uh, three solutions that you have in Intune. Uh, so that didn't match the old school stuff, the, the slightly more modern hybrid uh, where you do co-management together with Config Manager uh, and, and Intune. And the, the, the number three is really the modern way of doing it. So really cloud native. And we're going to plug into Intune. So we're going to work in both the hybrid and the cloud native scenarios. Uh, we don't have a direct integration with Config Manager, but obviously if you're hybrid, you can still use our uh, system to deploy those applications to your endpoints. How that process works is actually very simple. I'll demo that in a second as well. You can just go to our portal uh, and register for a trial. You can sign in with your Azure AD account. Uh, then we'll, we'll uh, ask to give, uh, to give us permissions with an app registration in your tenant so that we can deploy those applications. And after that's done, you can already start deploying applications to your users. And, and we've got an app store where you can very easily select some apps, deploy them down, and then they'll get installed on your devices. What we're doing continuously for all of those applications is we're scraping to see if there's updates available. If there are, we'll uh, package them, we'll push them through our test cycle, which, uh, as Stas already mentioned, also includes autopilot testing, very important. Um, and then once it's gone through our test cycle, we'll push it to your tenant and, and uh, into we'll make sure that it gets updated on your device. And now it's time for the demo. So, this is um, our, our trial account. We haven't registered yet, so I'll just go through that registration flow to show you how simple it is. You've got a 15-day trial when you register, and we're, we're just going to sign in with our Azure AD account and fill out some company details. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to authenticate you to check if you already know you or your tenant, which shouldn't be the case, but obviously it's demos, so it might go wrong, and it doesn't look like um, and then we get a bit of terms and conditions. I'm sure everyone always reads those very carefully. And then we get to, to the grant consent bit. So here's where we're actually going to ask for permissions to manage those apps in your tenant. We are asking for three write permissions for groups, Intune apps and Intune devices. I'll explain uh, during the demo when we've got time for that, why we need those permissions. And then we've got to fill out some company details, which I'll quickly do here. And then we're already good to go. So then we end up at our dashboard where, as you can see, there's not a lot going on yet because we haven't really uh, installed any apps yet. There's not really any history. Where the cool stuff happens is in, in the App Store, where I'll just take SimZip as an example because it's got a lot of options that I'll uh, deploy down. The idea is to really make it very simple. You can just select the language for the application. Um, if you select the language, you make sure it gets deployed in that specific language. If you select multi-language, you'll leave the default of the application. So the application itself will decide in which language it's going to display. Um, you can choose some options here. This is about the pop-up. We've recently, actually yesterday, released a version where we can give a more modern pop-up uh, and then some uh, customizations for that pop-up. And if you want a desktop shortcut or not, and you can already choose for who you want to deploy that application. If you select a user here, we'll actually create a group and we'll populate that group with those users. And that's the reason why we need permissions in your tenants to create groups, because Intune doesn't support that out of the box to assign an application to a user. So we're creating the group for you. And then if I were to click install, we would already be creating the uh, application. Now, obviously there's an advanced button that's probably more interesting for you guys, uh, where you have a lot more options. So first of all, you can choose uh, the business for the application. I'm, uh, I'm guessing that's clear for everyone. You can also create uh, dependencies. I can't right now because we haven't installed any other application yet, but imagine that we have, then we'd be, we would be able to select it here and we would first install that other application. And uh, then only when, when uh, the other application is installed, we would actually deploy down 7-zip on, on the device. Then the next thing is the commands, so you can see uh, what we're running and also customize it. So we are using uh, PowerShell App Deployment Toolkit, which is a very powerful framework with a lot of functionality, a lot of logic in it. And we use that framework to deploy our applications and, and we use that logic as well. Um, for example, here with 7-Zip, we are going to uninstall 
the executable version of 7-zip because we are actually using the 64-bit MSI in this example, and 7-zip doesn't support migrating between those versions. Uh, so that's why we're also removing whatever incompatible version that might be there. And Taz already touched on that as well. For example, with Google Chrome, we are also removing uh, the, the user context installed Google Chrome. We have some logic for that as well. So we really try to handle uh, as much as shadow IT as possible uh, for you already, that if something happened on the device in the past, that we try to clean that up and really take control over that application. And obviously you can customize stuff here, you can add stuff and when you save it, it will actually push down that application and all of its updates with that uh, stuff that you added here. Obviously if you do this exactly, it's not gonna work, that's gonna break stuff. Um, and you can also here see in the post install that we're, for example, for 7-zip configuring a registry key that's gonna uh, change the language to English, uh, but obviously this is also different for every single application. And on the next bit, we get to the update rings. Um, so by default, we're deploying a single application. When we update it, it'll get updated for all of your users, but you can also enable update rings. What we'll do then is we'll actually create three applications in your tenants, and we'll update those applications with the amount of delay that you can specify here. So you can go up to 30 days, and then when uh, an update is released on our platform, we'll wait the defined number of days before we're actually gonna push that update to your tenant instead of doing it straight away. And then in the assignments tab for each ring, you can select which user or which group you're gonna put in those rings, et cetera, et cetera. And last but not least, uh, the assignment type, that's also a pretty important one. Um, so by default, we're doing required, which means that the application is gonna get in the installed on the device no matter what, but we can also do uh, available. Available means that the application is going to be available in the company portal, and then we run into the issue where it's difficult to keep it up to date. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, make a second application that's going to be in charge of, the, of updating the existing app. And if you were to assign it to all users, for example, that update app, you would also tackle shadow IT. So if anyone in the past installed an application themselves, we would see it and we would actually uh, keep it up to date for them without uh, them having uh, you doing uh, manual stuff for that. We would just discover the application on that device. And, and uh, if we discover it on the device, then we'll actually update it. The entire technical explanation about how we do that, I'll, I'll keep for a longer demo because we don't have a lot of time today. Um, and then when we click through the UI, when we've selected some users, what we'll do is and when I click install, what happens is we're posting to our API. Our API is downloading all of the source files, checking that the hashes of those source files, which is, we've run through VirusTotal, still match with what we've got in our database. We're fire scanning again. We're injecting all of those commands. We're signing the PowerShell, wrapping it to an Intune Win, and then uploading it to your tenant. So basically we're keeping that uh, application up to date, fully automated for you and then it gets added to the installations while it's being deployed, it's grayed out, but in a few minutes, it will no longer be grayed out if everything goes well. And I'll just switch to a different tenant where we've got a bit of history. And there we can very easily uh, see, manage those, those rings and say, uh, we're updating the fast ring today to 21.08. Uh, but 21.08 completely breaks 7-zip, which is one of your most critical uh, line of business applications. You can just disable the updates for the other rings fix whatever needs to be fixed, re-enable those updates, or like you've got a zero day in Chrome and you've got it configured to 10 and 30 days, you can just go to update now and we'll update that application straight away. The button is not available right now because there's no update for 7 but imagine that there would be, then you would just be able to update application straight away. Um, then the next bit I, I want to briefly talk about is the reporting section. So uh, what we do every night is we collect the logs in your tenants. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna um, process that and, and give you an overview of all of those applications. So you can select multiple applications here. You can export the data to a CSV, go back 30 days in time. So we try to give you some uh, more elaborate, elaborate reporting than is included in uh, Intune by default. And what we also do is because we know exactly which applications have failed, we also know exactly where the log files are. We um, are gonna automatically trigger the log collection feature in Intune and instead of you having to find out where the log file was actually at and, and then waiting between two and two million hours before the log file is actually uploaded, you can just go to the portal and, and with a bit of luck, the log file is gonna be available and you can just download it and um, it'll be available for you to, to see what actually went wrong during that installation. Uh, 
we're pushing multiple applications to Intune, so you can configure a naming convention for those applications if you want to. We've already got a default, but you can customize that. And this is the old pop-up, pop -up, so the classic pop-up that we're currently uh, showing. This logo you can customize yourself should you want to. Uh, and, and if you customize the new pop-up, the modern one will also automatically take over that logo. And then the last bit is where you can invite additional admins uh, to manage the platform. We've got some roles here where you can manage uh, either as read-only admin or as a uh, full-on admin here as well. And last but not least, for the managed service providers amongst you, uh, we have a multi-tenancy feature as well. So here I'm actually signed in with an MSP and I was working on my customer. So you can see exactly what your customer is seeing. But on your own tenant, you have some additional features where you can invite uh, additional customers, pretty similar to the CSP system of Microsoft. So you can invite them and when they uh, register or they just browse the link, they'll be connected to you and you'll get ex access to their tenants. And last but not least is application sets, where we try to make it very easy to manage a lot of applications and a lot of, and a lot of customers at the same time. So um, imagine you, you have uh, 20 customers and instead of having to deploy Google Chrome, 7-Zip, all of those standard applications to all of those customers manually, you can just create an application, sit at some applications here, and then uh, assign it to those customers. And, and basically, with a, just a few clicks, you you can deploy several several hundred applications to those customers uh, without doing a lot of uh, clicking yourself. We can also do update rings for those. Um, the, it works slightly different than the other update rings. Here, you're actually going to put a customer in an update ring instead of a subset of those users or devices for that customer. All right, that was it for my uh, very brief demo. I'm going to look at Martin to see if we've got any questions in the chat. Uh, uh, yes, we had some questions. All right. Uh, I think a few of them already got answered. Okay. But uh, we've got one from uh, Dennis. So deploying software for multiple tenants, mm -hmm. uh, will it be possible in the future to use the ring principle for child tenants instead of only being able to choose either all users or all devices. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> um, we're recording, so I gotta be a bit careful. But let's just say that it's in the back of my, uh, in the back of our minds. <laughs> Anything else? Let's see. Uh, can you also make app sets on group level? Yeah, same question. Yeah, yeah. same question. Okay. Um, I see that. Michael already answered the question regarding uh, Tenable. Uh, not sure if uh, Des or Michael wants to add something to it. Well, I, I just think in general that um, Microsoft is indeed like like Michael said, they're catching up. They're strongly focused on endpoints at the moment, and they're expanding their network and IoT work. Um, it's basic at the moment. So, for example, for networking, the Specific vendors only supported, not all vendors are supported. Um, I do believe that Microsoft will be catching up on that, um, and it is something to watch out for when this support will expand. Cool, thanks. Um, okay, and then the last thing I forgot to mention, story of my life, is about the licensing. Um, so how our licensing works is we really integrate with your Microsoft 365 subscription. And we're going to look at the number of uh, users that you have assigned in your tenant uh, that contains an Intune enti entitlement. So basically, if you if the license is assigned and you can do Intune with that license, we're going to count it. So really, uh, just follow the number of Microsoft 365 licenses in your tenant. Sorry. Uh, 